And uh, yes, and so we'll, we'll, we'll leave it to you. I mean, it's very familiar to us, but uh, uh, it'd be really nice to hear another, another, another angle on the whole idea of the Messiah, the anointed one, the Christ. <clears throat> So it's interesting, actually, you say the anointed one, because it's a good place to start with a definition um, and particularly the language of Messiah from the Hebrew Mashiach, um, meaning anointed. Um, and I actually have a little presentation, just a few sources that I thought might be useful. So I, I will share my screen if that's all right with everyone. Yeah, I think I, I'll make you a co-host and then I think you can do it. Yes. Okay. Thank okay. you. Right. Fab. Okay, so it'll be a bit meta for a minute. Um, right, so I'll just kind of start from the beginning. Um, as I said, um, it's great that you said uh, Messiah, anointed one. What does that mean? Because our first kind of interaction with the word itself is not anything to do with the messiah as we kind of conceive of this end of days or um this ultimate redeemer but actually with the high priest in leviticus that's the first kind of instance of this word um and it's it's talking about the anointed one because there are several figures um within jewish uh, thought and Jewish law that are anointed in order to occupy their role of authority and one of them is the high priest um, and so it's worth mentioning that this word is kind of ambiguous and that both allows for like artistic license how we how the lit liturgy uses that word um, and how actually in prophets and writings, how the word is used can change depending on who's writing um, and what about. Um, and so there are, it's multifaceted and it, it does not necessarily in Jewish tradition refer to the ultimate redeemer um, or mess messiah as we would understand perhaps in English more. Um, and so I just want to talk about a few issues that surround this idea of the messiah. Who is the Messiah? Is it the Messiah? Is it a Messiah? Are there several kind of generations of Messiah? In Jewish tradition, there is an idea of the Messiah of the son of David, so the Mashiach ben David, um, and a Messiah, the son of Joseph, a Mashiach ben Yosef. And those denote different characteristics. Um, so they're both uh, mythologized, there is an understanding of what they represent, stages of history that they represent, as well as um, the lineage that they have. And so often there is that tension. It's usually unclear whether or not um, the literal or metaphorical meaning is behind the intentions of the author when Jewish authors talk about the son of David or the son of Joseph. Um, also an interesting dynamic is the gender. The Messiah often assume, is assumed to be male, um, but in some uh, mystical texts in, in Judaism, there is an understanding of the characteristics of God that um, a messianic age embodies. And there is a kind of undertone of femininity of God, which is perceived to override a masculine world and that is what generates a messianic age so that's an interesting concept it's very um radical i wouldn't say that's a general understanding of the messiah but it's an interesting question i think it's worth noting that um there are a plethora of I understandings and ideas of what the messianic age involves and gender is there um then talking about when so the idea of what enables the messiah to come i mean jews um yeah, all Jews really believe that the Messiah hasn't come. There are some sects which perhaps some radical um, extremes of those sects, for example, um, Hasidim or ultra-Orthodox Jews who belong to a sect called Chabad um, or Lubavitch, which is the place in Russia that, that, that they originate, who do believe their Rebbe, their leader, um, to, be the, to have been the Messiah. Although 
um, that's very, it's rejected in mainstream orthodoxy and in, in actually mainstream Judaism in all, all denominations. So there is this idea of a looming sense of the Messiah in Judaism. The Messiah has not yet come. And in a sense, that's been fostered for so long that it's integral to the idea of the Messiah itself. It's almost as if the Messiah in and of itself denotes an unachievability <laughs> or a perpetual coming, a perpetual anticipation of the Messiah. Um, and then what is the Messiah? What happens? What, like, what does it entail um, when the Messiah comes, if the Messiah comes, what is that going to look like according to um, different theological Jewish sources? Um, and that looks like a whole range of things, depending on who you ask. Um, and so there are Talmudic sources, there are sages, ancient sources, there are medieval sources, there are modern sources, and they all refer not only to the ideas that they are digesting from previous generations, but also they respond to the context, um, their own historical context, and talk about what they potentially, what their utopia looks like. Um, and so in that way, it's also reflective and a response um, to the individual and to their societies and norms and cultures. So for, for many, the ideas of sovereignty, the ideas of statehood, of Jewish return to the land of Israel are prominent. Um, independence, the idea of, for many medieval commentators especially, the idea that Jews would once again, or for the first time even, be, um, be able to live without a, an oppressive majority. The idea that, that for them, a lot of the experiences of medieval Europe and also um, medieval, um, medieval Iraq or Iran or wherever they are, um, not that those countries existed, but the Arab world, um, were places where they felt um, either treated well or treated poorly, but minority status. And so the idea that they would once again have independence um, and the temple features as part of that independence, a kind of religious haven um, and a symbol of God's return and the Jewish return. And there is a synergy um, and it's not clear where one begins and the other ends. Who initiates that conversation? Does God invite the Jews to return? Or do the Jews return and invite God to rest among them? So there is a, a kind of conversation to be had among commentators as to how that process is initiated. And then this idea of general goodness, what happens when the world ends or at the end of days and the idea of perpetual justice, a cessation of war um, and poverty even, there are all these kinds of implications in lots of texts. So I'll just go on, I just had a little picture. Um, you can't see the title of this, but it's the 13 articles of faith um, that Maimonides sets out. And um, as part of their prayers, sometimes Orthodox Jews say them at least. And the 12th of these 13 is the belief in the arrival of the Messiah and the Messianic era. So it clearly is um, a strong article of faith. However, this translation is not exactly accurate. The Hebrew is Beviat HaMashiach, which means in the coming of the Messiah, not in the arrival of the Messiah. So like I mentioned before, this idea of whether the Messiah is always coming or whether the Messiah will come is actually a very crucial distinction for a lot of Jewish thinkers, especially in the modern era. Um, so I'll move on. Um, right, so this is, again, this is the Hebrew, so that just makes it a bit clearer, for me anyway. Um, this is the standing prayer that, that Jews recite um, pretty much uh, every day, three times a day at the max, or on, on the Sabbath, four times a day, um, and on Yom Kippur, the holiest day of the year, five times a day. And within that is this understanding of the ultimate days of, of um, redemption as being symbolized by this idea of resurrecting of the dead. And so that does feature as part of the messianic era, the messianic um, uh, promise is one of resurrection of the dead. And so 
Um, that's definitely part of the liturgy and part of the understandings. Um, there, I, I'm creating the Talmud here, um, and there is this question of when is brought up in the Talmud itself. And for some of these sages, for some of these voices, they've actually witnessed the destruction of the second temple. And so this discussion isn't just an ethereal kind of conversation, but it is really quite practical for some of them. However, the way that they choose to address it is vastly different. Um, and different voices really have um, sometimes really conflicting messages. Um, so in this scene, um, Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi, he says to Elijah, the prophet, so often in the Talmud, they'll have these conversations, which we're not sure if they think they happened or if they kind of imagine them, if they dream them, what, what exactly is happening. But he says to Elijah, the prophet, when will the Messiah come? And Elijah says to him, go ask. So Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi asks and says, where's he sitting? Like, wh where can I find him? And Elijah says at the entrance of the city of Rome. And so Yeshua ben Levi asks him, and what is he identifying as a sign, right? So how, how can I find him? Like, what, how do I recognize him? And Elijah says, he sits among the poor who suffer from illness. And all of them unite their bandages and tie them all at once. But the Messiah unties one bandage and ties one at a time. He says, perhaps I will be needed to serve to bring about the redemption. Therefore, I will never tie more than one bandage so that I will not be delayed. So there's this bizarre scene um, and there's so many messages. I mean, the idea that obviously the, the Messiah is sitting among the, the poor and the ill and the sick, I think that's a very common theme of what the Messiah, who the Messiah is and what they represent. Um, but also this idea of the, the urgency of messianic fervor, this idea that the Messiah could be needed at any time and so there's always this need to be ready. And actually when I grew up in my home, my mother had a bag under the bed that was packed always in case the Messiah came, <laughs> which may sound absolutely bonkers and it definitely did to me, but um, she came, she became religious through um, the Chabad tradition that I talked about. Um, and so for, for that particular Kabbalistic mystic um, section of Orthodox Jews, it really is a, a concern that they be ready, um, lest they tarry when the Messiah arrives. Um, this is another section of the same thing. So he went over to the Messiah um, and he says, greetings to you. The Messiah says greetings to him. And he calls him my rabbi, my teacher. There's the sense of like, he, he's not fawning over him in the way that one might expect. Messiah says greetings to you. When will the master come? The Messiah says, today. Sometime later, Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi came to Elijah and Elijah, said, Elijah says to him, what did he say to you? And he said, um, well, shalom to you, you know, greetings. Elijah says to him, he guaranteed you and your father will enter the world to come as he greeted you with peace. Because he, he basically interprets this interaction for Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi, Elijah. Elijah says, oh, he said that to you. That means you and your, your father are granted the world to come. And your, Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi responds, said, the Messiah lied to me. He said, I'm coming today. And he didn't come. <laughs> he says, this is outrageous. Um, you know, why do you lie to me? And he said to him, that's what he said to you. He said, he will come today if you listen to his voice this idea that like he could come today like he really could if you only did the right thing if you only hearkened to the voice of god if you only um lived by the commandments etc etc and that idea is really quite prevalent in in a lot of mystical jewish thought and even in common jewish practice there is an idea that if all jews in the world observed two sabbaths in a row that the Messiah would have to come. That's it. It's like a, it's like almost like a loophole in the law, like that God designed this planet and that we can somehow wangle the Messiah into coming. Um, and it, it's an interesting and very Jewish narrative about what the Messiah is and how you get the Messiah to come. Um, so the story obviously continues. <laughs> um, there is a question of Rabbi Yossi um, and he his students ask him when will the son of David come so again these interchangeable 
um, titles, not just the Messiah, but the son of David. The son of David could be an element of the messianic era. They could be, you need the son of David and the son of Joseph to come in order to like have that perfect balance of forces, whatever that means. Or it could just be, that's another, it's a synonym for generally the Messiah. It's, it's not really clear. And Rabbi Yossi says, I'm hesitant to answer you, lest you request from me a sign to corroborate my statement. And they said to him, we're not asking for a sign. Don't worry about it. Like, just, just tell us something. We just want to know. We won't ask anymore. So he says, okay, fine. When this exiting gate of Rome falls and will not be rebuilt, and it will fall and will be rebuilt and will fall a third time. And they will not give us to manage to rebuild it until the son of David comes. The student said, to, so this is a very complicated kind of answer. Um, but it basically revolves around this, a similar sentiment that we saw before, which is the idea that Rome is the civilization that is massive and oppressive at this period and, and it's taken away our independence and we're now a vassal state. Um, and so we're really waiting for this civilization to crumble in essence, so that we can have our own independence back. Um, and they won't manage to rebuild their empire until the son of David comes, which is an interesting argument as if we don't actually want their civilization to collapse entirely we just kind of want it to collapse enough that they they accept that we have our own independence and that they rebuild unto themselves but then the students say back our rabbi give us a sign which is the exact thing they promised they wouldn't ask um but they ask it anyway because they can't help themselves right because this is sort of the conversation i think any messianic journey takes on itself which is okay we want to know something and then as soon as we know something, we kind of, we need to know how do we know that, you know? Okay, so you've told me that it's gonna mean X. Well, how do I know when it comes? If it's gonna come, then I need to navigate that. How do I know it's real? How do I know who it is? All of those questions are kind of implicit in these passages. And he says, um, didn't you say that you weren't gonna ask me? And they said, okay, yeah, we said that, but please, please just give it to us anyway. Um, and he says to them, if it is, as I say, the water of the cave of Pamias um, will be transformed into blood. And the Gemara, which is the, the narrator relates, and it was transformed into blood. Also a really interesting image because that is obviously reminiscent of the Nile and the plague. And the paradigm for a lot of messianic visions is that of Egypt and is the redemption of the Israelites or the Hebrews from slavery in Egypt. And so a lot of the stories and the trajectories that are envisioned by Jewish thinkers take place through the lens of Egypt and through that um, story of um, homelessness and oppression and the redemption by God through signs um, and ultimately um, the the building of a society of their own in the land of Israel or the land of Canaan, which becomes the land of Israel. Um, so the next thing, we, we already kind of talked about this idea of the Davidic line, but it's worth mentioning in Samuel, um, there is an interesting use of the word, um, the anointed. So um, we're not really told this, that this boy is called David, um, but he's the youngest son, and he's not the one that Samuel initially thinks will be the anointed king. Um, but God says, no, there's another son. It's not the one you think it is. Send for him. And so um, Jesse brings his youngest son, and God says, rise, anoint him. This is the one. And uh, it says, Samuel took the horn and anointed him in the presence of his brothers, and the spirit of the Lord gripped David from that day on. But there's an interesting lack of the name of David when it says Samuel took the oil and anointed him. It doesn't say anointed David. And then it continues in the midst of his brothers. And that's sort of a pause above the word. There's a, sort of a pause. Um, I don't know if you can see there's notations. Um, and those are the way that the, the verse is sung in synagogue. And so those denote where to stop and where to start often. And so that phrase is unto itself. And it seems to 
carry or perhaps it carries that message of this is how it's going to take place forever and the fact that then we have the the spirit of god which grips david um is a kind of personal experience of david um but that first beginning initiation of the king is something that will happen for a few generations and perhaps the line breaks but it will be rebuilt in this image of the messiah um okay so then they talk more about this idea um of david's uh, the son of david and when he will come um there are all these really interesting images but one i just want to draw attention to is Amar Ulla. So Ulla is a voice in the Talmud. And he he says a really like kind of sad image. He says, let the Messiah come, but after I die, I don't I don't want to see him. As I fear, and this is implicit, although I should let you know that the bolded language is the is the language in in Aramaic. The the rest of it is kind of the commentary that helps us actually understand a very notational form. Um, of of the Talmud so um he says I don't want to see him and Rabba says Rabba's another voice let the Messiah come but after my death so that I won't see him and then Rav Yosef piles on and says let the Messiah come and I will be privileged to sit in the shadow of his donkey's excrement essentially saying what are you talking about you can't say you don't want to be around like this is it this is the moment how could you possibly opt out of that just because you're afraid that maybe you don't you won't be judged well don't you want to witness the greatest moment in history um and so that's kind of an interesting they're very there's pessimism and an optimism and i think that runs through anyone who kind of is familiar with this idea of an apocalyptic messiah this idea that before um, the brightest moment there has to be a darkness before the dawn and and that the the story of Gog or Magog this idea of, of battling forces before the messiah um there's there's an underlying theme in that that there's something worrying something's going to go wrong before it goes right and so I think perhaps there is a hesitancy because it's unknown and because it's it's unnerving if you're an imperfect human being to suddenly think about a messianic age in which um, potentially according to Jewish tradition you will be judged and there will be a certain expectation of your your lifestyle and your choice that leads you to be among those who live in the messianic the messianic era and who people who make it basically um and uh We'll just go on because we don't have time to do everything. Um, but when, while the, this conversation is happening, the Talmud itself asks, what, wait a second, what's his name? What do we call this person? Um, which also is interesting because um, that isn't really a question that anyone can answer. And it's not a question that seems rational for the Gemara to ask itself. Um, because obviously it's the future and we don't presume to know, um, which is also a, a theme throughout the medieval sources and later sources is we don't know, we're not supposed to know, who knows. Um, but the Gemara anyway asked, what's his name? And the school of Rabbi Sheila says, Shiloh is his name, which is interesting as well because those are very similar names. <laughs> so he says, oh, it, it's, it's quite like my name actually. Um, but Shiloh is his name, as it's stated, until when Shiloh shall come. So um, he quotes Genesis. And this is throughout the Talmud. Um, quotations are basically proofs. Um, and so every person who wants to kind of uh, expound uh, their understanding will bring a proof. The school of Rabbi Yanai says, Yenon is his name. Also, sus, suspicious. Um, as it stated, may his name endure forever, may his name continue, Yunon, as long as the sun. The school of Rabbi Chanina says, Chanina is his name, as it stated, for I will show you no favor. Chain is, means favor. Um, and some say that Menachem ben uh, Yitzkiah is his name, as it stated, because the comforter, Menachem, 
that should relieve my soul is far from me. And the rabbis say, so the rabbis is the majority position. That's what that means. It means everyone else basically said, the leper of the house of Rebbe Yehuda Hanasi is his name, which is fascinating. There is this self-indulgence about trying to name the Messiah after you. And the rabbis go, wait a second. It's not any of your names. It's the leper's name, um, which is brilliant um, as a kind of rebuttal to this indulgence. Um, as it is stated, indeed, our illnesses he did bear and our pains he endured, yet did we did esteem him injured, stricken by God and afflicted. Um, and so perhaps that's something that I imagine Christians are really familiar with. Um, and so it's not something that we really talk about. All of these texts are basically brand new to me. I brought them to you because I searched them out in the last kind of week. Um, so, but this is a beautiful idea. And it's definitely one that's shared by a lot of, I think, um, faith is the idea that the person you least suspect of representing um, the most glorious um, and the most um, sacred is the exact right person, correct person to do those things. Um, okay, and then we have Rav Nachman and he says, if the Messiah is living uh, among the living in this generation, he is a person such as me, who already has dominion over the Jewish people, as it is stated, and their prince shall be of themselves, and their governor shall proceed from their midst, indicating the Redeemer is already in power. So this is a really different understanding of what the Messiah is and where they come from. It's not this idea of the lowest uh, strata of society, the leper and the outcast, but it's actually the ultimate insider. This person has to be um, someone from within and someone who's respected and esteemed, um, which is actually really interesting because the rabbis sort of imply that this leper is kind of an important leper. It's the leper everyone knows because he's the leper of Rebbe Yehud Ahanasi, who is the prince. And so there is this tension between the outsider and the insider, who is the Messiah. He must come from the Davidic line, but he also must be an oppressed, lowly, humble man or woman. And so this idea is in conflict, even within the suggestions of the rabbis, which seems like it's a rebuttal against this important um, figure. And even in Samuel, in the story of David and his chosenness, there is that discrepancy between what Samuel believes. Samuel looks at this tall son of Jesse and says, it must be him. And God says, no, it's the short reddish kind of one. Um, and so there is that sense of, okay, well, David is the, the underdog. Uh, at the same time, um, David is from the tribe of Judah, maybe, and Judah is important and significant. And this family is, is the one that God has chosen. And so there is that kind of um, difficulty or tension. Um, okay, I'm going to move on, even though there were amazing sources, um, to this idea of when. When does it take place? How long does it last? This idea of the mess messianic era that perhaps I initially came to this with was a, a kind of infinite time span it ends with the messiah there's no end to the messianic era the messianic era is the end but actually a lot of uh, com uh comments in the talmud suggest that actually it doesn't last very long um so this idea that the messianic era will be 40 years long or the messianic era will be 70 years um so it, it's quite an interesting time span Obviously, 40 years, 70 years, those are all very laden with biblical connotations and they describe different periods that we might associate with different stories and different um, promises. But still, it's an interesting concept to think the Messianic era only lasts so long. Um, and so this is Rabbi Yehud Nasi, who is this prince who has the leper servant, apparently, um, who the rabbis have identified is the Messiah. So I don't know why they need to be talking about it if they know who it is. I think obviously the point is that it could be the leper of Rabbi Yehud Nasi. Um, so he says the messianic era will last three generations. As it's stated, they fear you as long as the sun and the moon endure throughout the generations. Um, and so those two words in Hebrew add up to kind of three of the word because 
the first is in singular and the second in plural, meaning so it's three. Um, Rabbi Hillel says there is no Messiah coming. There is no Messiah um, for the Jewish people as they already ate from him, as in all his prophecies relating to the Messiah were already fulfilled during the days of Cheskia, which is wild. Um, <laughs> there is this opinion that the Messiah is come and gone. That's it. Like it's over. Um, and the second temple, essentially the rebuilding was, was the fulfillment of prophecies and um, it's over and done with. Now that is not the accepted tradition. Um, and there are many scholars who basically refute that outright. Um, and so <clears throat> um, this kind of is some of that refutation. Um, but also again, how many years it's gonna last, 365 years, 400 years, 40 years. Again, those numbers are kind of triggers, sound bites and things we've already come across in the Bible. Um, and I'm gonna just move on. Um, there is this interesting tension in Jewish thought and philosophy about what's the difference between the messianic era and the world to come. So sorry, one second. For some reason, my emails have just cropped up. Um, so there is assumed to be a difference. However, in lots of the texts, they're actually um, almost interchangeable, the way that they're described, the world to come and um, the end of days. So um, Rabbi Chiyabar Abba and Rabbi Yochanan, they say in the prophecies with regard to redemption and the end of days, all the prophets prophesied only about the Messianic era. But with regard to the world to come, the reward is not quantifiable. As it says, no eye has seen it, God aside from you, who will do for those who will wait him? So we basically, it's sort of saying we know enough about the Messiah, but we don't really know anything about the world to come. Um, which is interesting because there are lots of throwaway remarks in the Talmud and other sources about the world to come. Of course, in the Bible itself, in the five books of Moses, in prophets, in writings, it's very, very difficult, near impossible to find anything about the world to come. Um, and maybe a bit more about the Messiah, but um, it, it's definitely something that comes across in the traditional texts that lead on from those. Um, so <clears throat> there is this opinion um, at the end, the Gemara, the Talmud brings it up to refute this previous opinion. It says, wait a second, didn't Shmuel say, Shmuel said, the difference between this world and the messianic era is only with regards to servitude to foreign kingdoms alone. He essentially says, the only thing that defines the messianic era is sovereignty, is independence. And so there is no magic, there is no, I don't know, God descending from heaven or resurrection of the dead necessarily. The only thing that's different is that we'll be our own nation, our sovereign state, um, and we won't have to serve other kingdoms anymore. We won't be a vassal state for Rome or for Babylon or any other empire. Um, so these are just some interesting photos from um, number one, Operation Solomon on the left in 1991 um, of Ethiopian Jews and Yemenite Jews on the right in 1950, because there was a lot of messianic further with the um, state of Israel just on on the back of what we just talked about, um, the idea that the, the ingathering of exiles was a crucial moment, which, which either signaled or was in and of itself a messianic promise. Um, it really did stir up feelings that the Messiah must be coming or the Messiah has already maybe even come. And so for a lot of um, Jews, uh, especially um, now more modern Orthodox Jews, it's called for a lot of Jews, the initiation of the state of Israel is called Reshit Smicha Golatenu, which means the kind of first barrier to our redemption. Um, and so it's not the full picture, it doesn't represent the full prophecy, but for some, and this is not the same for all Jews at all, not even within Orthodoxy and definitely not across denominations, um, but for some Jews, 
um, the ingathering of exiles that was witnessed during the inception of the state of Israel um, what was something akin to some kind of fulfillment of a biblical prophecy. Um, this is a really beautiful Gemara in a different place. It's in the, the tractate of, of Shabbat on the deals with the Sabbath, but it's completely random as sometimes the, the Talmud is. And it says, when a person is brought before the heavenly court, i.e. when a person dies, they're asked, were you trustworthy in business? Did you set aside, aside time for Torah, for study? Did you try to have children? I don't know why it says kids, that's really random. Did you hope for the Messiah? Did you argue intelligently? Did you understand things based on other things? <laughs> Which is just fascinating that these are the kind of um, core issues that God puts before you or that the heavenly court puts before you as a measure of your life's worth. Number one, the fact that oh, were well, you trustworthy in business is like so important. Um, were you honest? Did you try and fool people or trick people? Um, that is such a huge part of your life as well, that work obviously dominates our lives and, and maybe less so now than it did before, but that that is the vast majority of your time. And was it time that was honestly spent? Um, did you set aside time for the Torah, for, for study, for spirituality, for life with God? Did you try to have children? Interesting. Also interesting that it says try. It doesn't say that with the other two. Um, did you hope for the Messiah? Again, interesting it says hope. Um, why doesn't it say, did you try and find the Messiah? Or did you try and become the Messiah? Why? Why does it say hope specifically? Did you argue intelligently? Amazing, I love that. Um, mostly because I think it's a reflection of what the people who wrote this valued. Um, they valued a good argument um, and they certainly brought one. Um, and did you understand things based on other things? Did you infer from context? Did you use the world around you and the knowledge around you to learn about everything else? Um, but key to this is also, did you hope for the Messiah? Did you? Did you actually want it to come? And it, that's interesting because of the opinions that we saw previously that said explicitly they hoped the Messiah did not come before they already died. Um, so I think there are these tensions or paradoxes. So this versions of the Messiah in which the Messiah is a break, it, it, it symbolizes the end of history or, or the turning point. Um, but there's also this idea that, that, that the world is leading to the Messiah, that every step of the journey, and we'll see this in Maimonides, because I'll, I'll show you hopefully in the next couple of minutes, that Maimonides really saw the world as slowly progressing, a kind of liberal Whiggish history. Um, and so there is that apocalyptic vision, and there is also this progressive vision. And so one doesn't have to accept this idea either way, um, there are various different um, uh, pictures of the Messiah and the Messianic era that are floating around. We also have this idea of restoration or revolution. This is an idea that maybe we're just trying to go back to what we already had, maybe Jews collecting back in the land of Israel, creating the temple again, um, having an independence again. All of those things are sort of just restoring something. But there's also a sense that, you know, the dead uh, being revived, the resurrection of the dead. That's like the ultimate restoration. Um, that's really like a, a sort of turning back time. Uh, you can almost see it like in a film, um, but there's this revolutionary aspect as well. There's this idea that things will never be the same again. This is also prevalent in later sources and later commentators. This idea that there will no, never be war again, that um, there will be a unanimous kind of monotheism, that people will accept God, um, not that they'll accept Judaism, that's not so clear, but, but that people will accept there is only one God. Um, and so that's an interesting discussion. And then we have the, the kind of really practical question, okay, well then who does it? Um, there are images in the Talmud, um, Rashi is a commentator, a French late uh, kind of uh, 11th century, 12th century, I'm definitely getting that wrong, commentator, he 
he suggests that the temple will literally just descend from heaven when the world is ready, as if it's perfectly built, God is keeping it like in a, a box and it will just fall. Um, and then of course you have images of, no, the temple, it, it's gonna be built and we're gonna basically force the Messiah to come by creating all of the, we're gonna tick every box until he has to come, like there has to be a messiah because we're living in the messianic age so what what produces what is the messiah the one who ushers in the messianic age or is the messianic condition breed the messiah which follows which um so this is maimonides this is kind of <clears throat> a, a bit of a savage read but um he talks about who does not have a share in the world to come um, so he says, sectarians, heretics, deniers of the terror, deniers of resurrection, deniers of the coming of the Messiah, apostates, et cetera, et cetera. So he includes within them people who deny the Messiah. So it clearly is a big deal for him. However, um, if I go later, he talks about what actually the Messiah is and who he is and what he entails. He says, it should not occur to you that the King Messiah must bring wondrous signs or perform marvels or invent new things or revive the dead or anything like what the fools say. So this, this rationalist who's really influenced by like platonic kind of images of, of the world and of God, he, he talks about the very boring Messiah who kind of just is, and you have to sort of bet on him and you have no way of knowing that he is the one. Um, he basically says, the Torah doesn't change. Um, so the statues and laws will not change. So one way of knowing that someone isn't really the Messiah is if they try and change the rules. The rules are not gonna change. Um, but that's actually not, completely crystal clear there are opinions that for example fast days will become celebratory days after the messiah arrives things like that things will change because the mood and and the, the times have changed um but he continues he basically says if a king should arise from the house of david so one criterion is met who's versed in the torah another criterion that we haven't really seen so far that this person needs to be a scholar hasn't actually been explicit but apparently Maimonides assumes because it's Maimonides that it must be the case um, that this person is a scholar engages in the commandments as did David his forefather in accordance with both the written and the oral Torah and he enjoys all of Israel's following his ways encouraging them to repair its breaches interestingly it seems like he has to amass a following before we can really assess whether he's the messiah which seems a kind of circular logic I mean how are you supposed to choose to follow if the act of following might actually create the status that you're following him on the basis of. So it, it's kind of um, difficult. Um, and he also kind of culminates this in the fighting in the wars of God, this idea that the, the state and the sovereignty and the independence is the primary or is the final a measure of the Messiah. If he succeeds in these efforts and defeats the enemies around and builds the sanctuary, so building the sanctuary, I guess, is actually the final stage in its proper place, gathers to disperse of Israel, he is definitely the Messiah. So all he tells us is if the Messiah does what the Messiah is supposed to do, he is the Messiah, um, which is not so helpful. Um, but again, he kind of um, moves on and he says, he sort of says what we already know, but he spent a long time trying not to say it in a way. He says, the world is already now filled with matters of the Messiah and matters of the Torah and matters of the commandments, i.e. things have already spread. He's talking here specifically about Christianity and Islam. He's living among Muslims. And actually it's interesting that a lot of um, commentators who live among Christians speak very kindly of Christians and very unkindly of Muslims and commentators who live among Muslims tend to speak quite kindly of Muslims and quite poorly of Christians so here we have a commentator who lived among Muslims so he's going to talk probably quite kindly about Muslims and quite unkindly about Christians I'm afraid so he says the world is already filled with masters of the messiah 
Knowledge of these matters have spread to the distant islands and to many nations of those of uncircumcised hearts, meaning not Jewish. They discuss these matters in the commandments of the Torah. Some of them, as did Muhammad, say these commandments were once true, but have since been canceled for our times. So they were not meant to be observed for all generations. Some of them say that these are secret matters and not as simple as they would appear. And now the Messiah, Jesus, just has, has come and revealed these secrets. So he basically, I mean, this is his version of, of what he thinks these religions um, have changed or um, deviated from what he thinks is something immutable. Um, and that's why I guess he believes that they cannot possibly be um, the true Messiah because he thinks the Torah does not change. Um, so yeah, he basically thinks that again, he repeats, they have to keep to what their forefathers did in order to be the true Messiah. They can't have deviated in any way. Um, yeah, he talks about lots of flowery language that the Talmud has used. And he says, we don't really know what this means, but um, we'll find out at the end. Um, again, not so helpful. I'm gonna move on because even though this is great stuff, um, it's nowhere near <laughs> where we need to be <laughs> at this point of the evening. So I'll talk a little bit about the Zohar. The Zohar is a uh, 13th century Kabbalistic mystic source. It's very interesting. It's a bit, frankly, we don't derive law from it, but people find inspiration and interesting literary ideas um, from it. And it's informed a lot of thinking um, from the Hasidic sects, so from the mystic sects. Um, this is from Rav Nachman of Breslov, and he's writing, as you can see, in the early 19th century. Um, and he writes, the likewise corresponds to the revelation of the Moshiach or Messiah, at which time the lust for money will be eliminated. As it is written, on that day, man will throw off his idols of silver and his idols of gold. Um, so, so there's these kind of mystical utopian ideas of what the Messiah, the age of the Messiah will look like. Um, this is the Chafetz Chaim, who is not a mystic. Um, he's actually a halachist. He's a, he's a legal writer. And he writes um, at the end of his kind of preface of his big work, he writes, in spite of this, the power of repentance would have annulled the decree. How much more so, more than 800 years at the end of that day, should the Messiah come if we repented? The fault is ours alone, that with our many sins, we do not allow him to repose his shechina, his presence in our midst. So there's this understanding that actually we have to do something. We have to be better. We have to fulfill the commandments. We have to um, uh, create the atmosphere that's conducive to the Messiah's arrival. Um, and then we have an interesting kind of uh, deviation from this. This is the, um, he's called the Rav Cook, Rav Cook is his name, but um, this book of his is called Arat HaKodesh. Um, and it was actually gathered after he died by his student. Um, but this, he, he says in this, the light of the Messiah is also embedded in sacred nature and is connected with the great chain of the world, of the creator and his spirituality, the trend of his being and the ideals of his future. The world is not torn and shattered, standing as a solid building. So again, it's really difficult to understand what he's trying to say. Um, but I think part of that, he's saying the Messiah isn't achieved. It isn't something manufactured. It isn't one day not there and the next day net it, it is. But it's a culmination of something that exists. It's, it's all around us. It's, this is a very mystical, he was a mystic. So it, he's kind of drawing on this idea that everything is, is sacred and it's kind of panantheistic in this sense um, that we need to draw out the Messiah in every aspect of, of life, if you will. But he also talked about two halves. He talked about Mashiach ben David, so the Davidic Messiah and Mashiach ben Yosef, the, Joseph and I don't know how we would say that Messiah so there's this and he thinks about it in ideas of religion and the rest of the world he thinks that we shouldn't see them as two separate beings but rather as part of a wholeness and he thinks that David represents this religious and and um, spiritual dynamic and that Joseph represents the one who actually secures security and secures state and secures um, stability 
And so for him, he at some point, I think, references this idea the state of Israel may be a stage or maybe is the Moshiach ben Yosef, the, jo the Joseph's element of the Messianic age, but it's not the completion. Um, and so he, he was an interesting proponent of what the Messiah actually means. And then in terms of gender, I just want to circle back that um, this is uh, over here, Menachem Mendel Schneerson on the right, and he was the last Lubavitcher Rebbe, so he was the last leader of the Hasidic sect I spoke about earlier, um, which is quite a messianic sect. He's holding his uh, father-in-law's hand, which is also an interesting dynamic in terms of the gender dynamics within um, Hasidic sects. They're very segregated usually between men and women, um, but there's a great kind of affection um, involved. And so uh, the Kabbalistic and Hasidic teachings have a special understanding of that. I didn't write this, this is Dr. Susan Handelman. Um, but she wrote that they have a special understanding of the role of the feminine in the era of redemption and the world to come. Then say the classical sources, all the feminine aspects of the world will emerge from their concealment and demunition in the unredeemed world and rise to the highest stature. That is the deeper reason, says the Rebbe, that in our generation, the innovations increase in Torah study connected to and are emphasized in relation to women. So this Rebbe, the guy on the right, he had an idea that the, the might is right represents this world. It represents a, a pre-Messianic age, and that is masculinity. I wouldn't say men, I would say like masculinity, the, the current, the kind of gendered understanding of, of power versus kindness. And, and those are two um, characteristics of God in the Kabbalistic sense. There are seven kind of spheres of God. And there's an understanding that, that um, there are two elements of God. There is the feminine and the masculine. And what the messianic age perhaps implies is an overcoming of, of strength and knowledge with um, kindness and understanding. And so the former two being male traits and the latter two being understood as a feminine traits. Um, so that's just an interesting aspect. And again, this reference of in the merit of the righteous women of the generations were Jews redeemed from Egypt because that comes up in the Talmud. The Talmud talks about women as having motivated the um, exodus from Egypt. And so again, that's the paradigm through which a lot of sources talk about what the Messiah will hold. And then I wanna just touch on modern understandings. This is Yeshayahu Leibowitz, who was famously uh, uber rationalist. And he says, according to the second view, the Messiah is the one whom I await every day and who will come. Whereas the Messiah who has come, in fact, is always a false Messiah. So he basically believes there is no such thing as the Messiah who comes. The Messiah is the Messiah who's always coming. Um, and this is something Amos Oz, the writer, actually talks about when he travels the land of Israel and he gives lectures and, and, and has interviews with kind of radicals. And I think it's a really interesting message for modern Israel, but also for modern Jews, he says, I'm not a priori an enemy of the messianic idea, but neither am I an enthusiastic disciple of it. Rather, it seems to me that within the context of Jewish messianism, one might say that all messianism translated into the present tense is by definition false prophecy. The messianic idea can exist only in the grammatical and psychological future tense. Yes, this is an overwhelming paradox, but every messianic idea translated into the present tense is false. So on the one hand, that's very Jewish. And on the one hand, it's just pure heresy um, because there are so many strands of this messianic idea that sort of run a mock of one another. They, um, they seem to be utterly incompatible. So I don't have an answer for you. <laughs> um, it's just now eight o'clock. So I've managed to run my way through all of that. Unfortunately, I haven't left you a whole lot of time to ask questions, which I feel terrible about. Um, I'm happy to stay. Um, so whoever wants to is welcome to ask me questions. But yeah, I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. Two seconds. Here we go. That's amazing. Thank you so much. Would you, would you be willing to send us the slides? 
Yes, of course. So we can read them through. That would be great. Uh, can, will you allow us 10 more minutes? Absolutely. No, um, I think I can do. Everybody happy? We, normally we finish the state, but if, if you don't mind, uh, if you need to go, uh, just wave and, and go. But otherwise, you know, we'll stay for another 10 minutes. <laughs> uh, any, any questions or comments? I mean, that is just so fascinating. Oh. Silenced us. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, there are so many resonances. I mean, and I think it it really does give us a, a completely different entry point into our own understanding of, of Jesus as Messiah, and and you know the idea of uh, the Messiah having come but yet to come. Yeah. You know, is is so essential to Christianity, and it's. It's a kind of distortion of Christianity that just says, you know, oh, the Jews were there and then Jesus came and the Messiah was there and that, that's it now. Uh, and and the, the deep understanding there. And so many, just little things that you were saying just reminded me of the New Testament, you know, the idea of the temple coming from heaven, you know, in, in Revelation. I don't know if other people have, have thoughts. I was very struck when you talked about... Oh. I guess I've got myself on. Yeah. Um, the versions of the Messianic era, whether it's a break or a crescendo, as mm -hmm. you put it, restoration or revelation, revolution, and who initiates it, they're exactly the sorts of questions I'm thinking about. I mean, I, I, I teach theology when I'm teaching about the kingdom of God and, and, and the coming of the kingdom of God. And I just, I guess, here, and thank you so much for your talk, because hearing you just reminds me again how much we do have in common. And mm -hmm. Both Christians and Jews are awaiting something, and I think that's something we're waiting for is much more similar than than we'll often acknowledge. Yeah, um, and I actually think it's an amazing stepping stone to work for the kind of messianic era we envision, mm. because both of us have that trajectory, and so to create the world that we think um, the Messiah would exist in together is something that is such a simple way of having an interfaith relationship. Yeah. Maybe we can't hope for the Messiah unless we are working together. Yeah. I think I, I find it incredibly liberating to think about this idea of the Messiah never actually coming. It's always a future tense. But you always have to think that he could be coming. That's yes, I know, I know, I know. I know that's <laughs> a paradox, but, but I also find it liberating that, you know, they're... Well, because it's a paradox, it's impossible to express, isn't it? But yeah. the, the, the sense of always yearning forward, always looking for something forward, but knowing there's always more. Yeah. I think that's what I'm guessing at. And I think that's, that's a very profoundly Christian and Jewish and possibly Islamic, but I know less about that, um, way of being. And, and very hopeful in a weird kind of way, in the way that the world often isn't, when it when it looks for answers very specifically, mm -hmm. then it then it becomes, I don't know, it becomes destructive to find the answer and that's it. That's how I feel. And it also I think it links to your idea of to, to the idea of the feminine. I think the feminine understands that better than the masculine. The masculine looks for definite answers. Um I'm being very stereotypical, but I, I just think there's all those senses there. <laughs> No, we're talking in stereotypical terms. I think that it's a it's an easier way to kind of pop <laughs> into that. Yeah. Um, but we're not talking about men and women, so that makes it. Mm, yeah, exactly. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Graham, yeah. you, you look poised to to say something. Are you? No. Okay. <laughs> any other any other thoughts? I mean, to me, it's just absolutely fascinating to. To hear somebody talking from a, a, another faith perspective, you know, and the level of uh, disagreement and discussion and, and so on, it, it sort of makes you think, well, it's all right for us to do that as well, you know, it's, it's all right for us to disagree <laughs> with, with each other and to be trying to tease out the meaning of these, these ancient texts, uh, which we hold in common, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that idea of multiplicity is 
is also the celebration of the Messiah itself. I think that the idea that there are there isn't that solid truth, like you were saying before, Neil, like that there's this, um, yeah, I guess a sort of multifaceted nature of God and, and of nature and of all of those things being revealed and working together and somehow being utterly paradoxical. That is kind of that, that end of days um, vision to some extent, yeah. And, and I, I also was really touched, you know, when we, we, when you were talking about, you know, the Messiah being the leper or being found amongst, amongst the poor, you know, you thought, yes, this is, this is, this, this is where Jesus is coming from, you know, and this Sorry. is exactly what Jesus was saying, you know, and, and he wasn't bigging himself up, he was just saying, look here. In, in, in this mess, you know, in this crucifixion, you know, whatever. This is this is where you find the Messiah, you know, not yeah. in the palaces and the temples, you know. Absolutely. And there's a long line of prophets who say, you know, God doesn't want your sacrifices. Mm. God wants your kindness um, and your consideration for the society in which you live and, and that you're creating for one mm. another. Mm. And so I think that that's also a message for the Messiah, the way in which we envision what is the Messiah a building or a person or an institution, but rather what does the Messiah and the Messianic age mean? What does it represent? Who does it sit with? And it's definitely not power um, in terms of these sources anyway. Fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. Anybody else? Katrine, Liz? Liz is... Can I just ask if there are any books you would recommend, Abigail, that we might read? Um, on the Messiah, it's actually very difficult. No one wants to write on that because no one really has any answers for that. Um, there's a handbook of Jewish thought by um, Arie Kaplan, a rabbi Arie Kaplan. Um, and he talks about kind of, it's a summation, I guess, of lots of different opinions and lots of different mm. writings. There's some good footnotes in there. Um, it is quite Jewish, so I don't know how accessible it is. Right. Um, um, but I would, yeah, I would start there. That's a good place. I, I'm only on page three of this book, uh, but it's one that Nathan recommended to me. It's, it's back to oh, yes. it's called It's called Unto Us a Child is Born, Isaiah Advent and Our Jewish Neighbours. And it's by somebody called Tyler D. Mayfield. Yes, he's fantastic. Um, okay. Yeah. And that's from within the Christian world. And um, so he's probably got a much better understanding of, of what um, kind of where you're coming from and, and the text that you're familiar with, whereas yeah. I, I don't. So it seems to be an exegesis of the Isaiah passages that we read in in Advent, yeah. in the Advent lectionary. Yeah, but I mean, I, I've only just started to read it, but uh, it was no, recommended. We have some good recommendations. Yes. Well, I think that's been absolutely an amazing evening. Uh, I mean, you, you you kept us captivated for an hour. Um, so glad. And, and that's really, really quite something. Um, and there's so much. You know, in those slides, I, I could see there was a lot more, and you obviously put an enormous amount of work into it. Um, so we're extremely grateful to you oh, it's for that. My pleasure. And I hope that you can use the, use that <laughs> research for other things as well. But it's... at least I'll have an answer when I get to heaven. <laughs> in effort. <laughs> Uh, hopefully yeah. <laughs> um yeah no it was really my pleasure thank you for the opportunity it's really great to... oh thank you thank yeah. you and uh, uh, so, uh is, is anybody unhappy about uh, our making this recording more widely available no that's lovely that's great well thank you and uh, my pleasure famous. happy advent everyone uh, happy hanukkah we should thank say. Yeah, thank you hey, take care Thank you. Bye-bye.